Yeah. Okay, so again, I'm Hillary Kane. I am a member of the Coordinated Campaign Committee, and I will be bringing to you Running for Office 101. Uh, my plan here is to mostly go through a pretty short presentation about the basics of running for office. This is definitely a presentation that we've done before um, on some of, we have monthly webinars in the Coordinated Campaign Committee designed to really train candidates um, and potential campaign managers and other key volunteers, and of course, to encourage people to run for office. And so um, let me just say that this presentation is, we usually give it in the early part of the year, so say around January. Um, and one of the slides that I have will uh, imply that it is earlier in the year than it is. Um, but just know that, you know, a lot of what I'm presenting is still relevant today. And certainly, if you think about running for office in 2021 for next year, um, where in some states local offices are available in odd number of years, this will really give you a head start. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and get the presentation up and running. Um, so let me do present mode here and share screen. And you can give me a visual thumbs up if that is working. All right, great. So yes, I did originally present this about a year ago, probably at our in Salem at our um, last annual national meeting. Um, it's sort of a perennial favorite. And obviously running for office is somewhat is our bread and butter as a political party. And so it's really important that we do this kind of training. Um, so again, uh, feel free to also introduce yourself in the chat. Um, I do want to make some time later in the presentation for us to do Q&A and to get to know each other because I know that I am certainly not the only expert in this room. There are lots of other people who have run for office in the Green Party um, who will have things to contribute when we get into the conversation. Okay, so the overview. So why run for office? Um, you know, what are some of the things that we, that motivate us to run, particularly as Greens? So we're going to talk about that first. Um, I'm also going to cover just other important considerations, mostly from both from a personal level and a political level. Uh, we're going to talk about the arc of the campaign year, and that's, I think, the piece where it's going to be a little like, you know, off in terms of the calendar. Um, and then our next steps, you know, what is your next step if you're potentially running for office? So why run for office? And so normally if I was doing this in a, in a room, I would try to make this more interactive, um, which actually I can do. So let's do some, you know, call and response here. So feel free to unmute yourself, put yourself on stack. What are some of the reasons that folks should run for office? Take it away. Okay. Is that He's you, Chris? Stack. Yes, it is. Uh, one of the Chris's. <laughs> Apparently we have a bunch of them. Sure. Um, I, I ran for uh, Congress because I was tired of waiting for uh, the Democrats and the Republicans to do something. And they promised and they promised and they withdraw, you know, the, the support for whatever it is that they promised at the last minute and nothing changes. And, uh, you know, and then the, the, I was watching the, uh, the 2016 elections and how badly they cheated Bernie and the, the, you know the just the horror show of you know the the misalignment of uh, the the ballot uh, was just it was so obvious and yet nobody was saying anything and so you know. I couldn't, I couldn't call myself a Democrat any longer, and I couldn't, you know, stomach a, the Republicans, and the only people who had anything that was reasonable was the Green Party. And so I, I became a Green Party candidate and uh, ran. Great. Well, welcome. So I think what you're sort of summarizing is just the plain, obvious truth, like, we can do it better. Um, you know, the, the jokers that we've got from the major parties who are either in office or running for office just don't have the ideas that the American people need. Um, we, they're not necessarily great at implementing their ideas. Um, you know, we can do it better. So I think that's a fabulous reason to run for office. 
Um, what are some other reasons out there? Anybody else? And especially if you run for office yourself, like, you know, sounds like Chris has, you know, why did you run for office? This is George Gluck. Can you hear me? Hi, George. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm going to be running for the seventh time. Uh, I hope if we gain ballot access here in Maryland. Um, I've run just so that uh, the voters would have a progressive choice, which has not been the case in uh, six times I've run. In fact, I would not have run this time if a very progressive uh, Democrat had won the primary, but uh, it lost to the fellow who spent the most money ever getting to Congress, Mr. David Trump. Uh, so I'm hoping uh, you're going to tell me what I need to do this seventh time to win. I'll try. Uh, um, actually, I know what, what to do. I'm just waiting for enough young people to become voters. And uh, eventually that will happen. Yes. Great. Okay. So again, I think that's just sort of another variation on the theme of sort of we can do it better. The ideas that we've got out there are just not, they're not what we need. Um, and so I think, you know, some other, anybody else want to, you know, offer a different reason of why to run for office? I would love to share. Um, my name is Chris LaDuke and I'm in Boston. And the reason we need legislators is really because marching in the streets doesn't accomplish much. And even the civil rights movement was really just allowing people of color to vote. The Green Party is the only party that is prioritized. I mean, we all know our platform is the only sensible platform. We're the only party that isn't in anybody's pocket. And without legislators, it doesn't matter much. And <laughs> I hope we can change that. Great, thank you. Yeah, and I would say that it's a both and. You know, I think what we've seen in recent, you know, in the last month and a half is that, you know, taking to the streets does have an impact, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. And in order to actually implement those demands, you know, that requires, you know, legislators making things happen. So thank you for that, Chris. Um, Richard, I saw your hand up, very nice, using the, the, hand, the raise hand tool. Richard, do you want to give us another, uh, another take on why it's important to run for office or what motivates people to run for office or what our goals should be in running for office? To make a difference, to, to, to do something, because like I think it was the first Chris said that, you know, the politicians are taking us for granted because they realize that they don't have to do anything. We've got to speak out, more importantly, to get other people to speak out. And when you're on the political stage, that gives you an opportunity to hopefully people can hear you. And maybe some of them will listen. But you can't make the change if you're just going to sit down and model in your own madness. So to make that difference, thank you. That's it. Great. Thank you. All right. So, you know, some of the reasons that, you know, I wanted to talk about, um, you know, of course, to win, right? And I think, you know, winning for what? Many of the things that you all just articulated, right? Um, and so this is obviously an important reason for Greens to, to run for office, to win, so that we can actually, you know, take power. That is what a political party does. Implement the 10 key values, put our vision into action. And so certainly one important goal of running for office is to actually win and be able to make that difference. Um, but of course, there's other reasons. And so, and sometimes, you know, as a third party, still starting out and still, in, you know, growing and in our nascent stage, we have to recognize that there are other reasons before we're maybe ready to actually win, depending on the race that we're talking about. And so some of those other issues that people often talk about are bringing visibility to an issue. Um, so sometimes people kind of run on, you know, one issue on one issue platforms, which might be very relevant in a particular community. I mean, obviously this year, you know, it might be really impactful to be running on a platform around defunding the police or criminal justice reform. Um, certainly we've had people run for office really pushing in particular environmental agendas that are really hyper local and specific to their community context. Um, and another important reason that sometimes gets lost is to simply build the Green Party. You know, running for office is a, it's an exercise. It's a, it's a thing that we do. 
And to some degree, we can only get better at it with practice, like almost everything else. And so sometimes it's important simply to run for the sake of running to give our membership and ourselves the practice of doing the work. And of course, gaining some visibility, making sure that people know we exist and that there's an option to vote green on the ballot in November and to make sure that the Green Party name is out there. Um, and hopefully draw in more volunteers, supporters, donors through the campaign to then build the party and then the party builds the next campaign, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then a, a building name recognition for a future run. So not just the Green Party name, but your personal name. And so, you know, we had a guy here in Philadelphia years ago who came to us and he really wanted to run for city council. And I, I live in Philadelphia. And in Philadelphia, which is a big city, city council is, there's 10 city council districts. And yet we have probably 25 or more state representative districts within Philadelphia. And so if you do the math, it's a lot easier and smaller to run for state representative than it is to run for city council. And state rep is in the odd, even numbered years, city council is every four years in odd years. And so what we convinced this, this person to do was actually run for state rep first because he had approached us in an even numbered year. And we said, you know, run for state rep now, build your name recognition build your campaign infrastructure, just get your feet wet with this whole process, and then you will be ready to run for city council the following year, which is sort of a much bigger thing. And when you think about, you know, there's dozens of people from the major parties who it took many times for them to run, you know, they ran many times before they actually won. And, but part of that, when they finally crossed the finish line, a lot of it is, you know, the public finally knew who they were, there was name recognition, you know, it takes time to sort of build up all this infrastructure and get good at doing this. Perhaps George can speak to that as a, you know, an, a seven time candidate. Um, and then there's other reasons. So some of the things that people talked about earlier today, earlier when we were in discussion mode. All right, so some of the important considerations, other things that you should think about before you decide to run for office. So your personal, in the personal column, you know, do you have the time to do this? You know, what is your availability? Um, you know, and a lot of this sort of has to then correspond with your goals, right? If your goal is to simply build the Green Party chapter or to, you know, put your name out or to just make sure voters have an option for something different, you know, the time you might need to put in is a little less than if your goal is truly to win. I mean, if your goal is to win, it becomes almost a full-time job. Um, unless you're running for a really, really small, very local type of, of office. Um, so really think about your availability. Like, will you need to take a leave of absence from work in, you know, August, September, October, November? Um, is that even possible? Um, what kind of, you know, if you do have a job, and most of us do, you know, what's the nights and weekends, you know, like how much time, what are your other, you know, obligations, family, work, etc.? You know, what's your own stamina? You know, this actually, this is a physically, it can be a physically draining process. You know, in normal times, you're like running around town, going to community meetings every single evening. You know, your sleep is ne not necessarily what it should be. Um, obviously things are a little different, you know, now in COVID times because there's not any, you know, personal events. But again, if you're trying to, you know, squeeze in, you know, almost like what is another part-time job on top of a full-time job, you know, just do you have the, the bandwidth to be able to do all that? Um, because to, you know, to really run for office well and is sort of professionally and, um, you know, seriously as we possibly can, it really takes a big investment of time and energy. Um, what are your finances like? And this is not about you know, only people who, who should run for office should have money, you know, have money, you know, that is not what I'm saying here. Um, we, I have supported and backed very low income candidates, um, but it's difficult. And there are sometimes things that you might, you know, that are just easier when you have some resources. And again, I'm thinking more about in normal times when you might need access to a car, like if you're driving, if you're running for statewide office, you know, driving around the state to meet different communities. Um, you know, now, the, you know, the, t the consideration might be, you know, your internet at home and your access to a computer. 
um, your access to some technology and camera equipment if you're going to be doing lots of, you know, live streams and, you know, and video event type things. Um, you know, and also, you know, you're going to need to be asking other people to donate to your campaign. And in my experience, it's good practice. You know, you should be willing to donate to your own campaign as well. Now, that does not mean, you know, thousands of dollars that will like really set you back financially, whatever is comfortable for you. But, you know, you need to be sort of, I think it's best practice to be able, you, you should be investing in your campaign if you're going to ask other people to do the same. And whatever that amount is, it doesn't, it, you know, it's not so much the amount as more of like the symbolic gesture. Um, and again, if you might need to sort of take a leave of absence from work in the final months, those, that, those are other things that could impact your finances. Um, and like, what are the skeletons in your closet, right? And I, you know, it's kind of funny when you think about it, but the reality is that, um, you know, in today's day and age, there are no secrets at all ever <laughs> and things may come out out about you and um and they might not even be things that you're you should be embarrassed about but how will they be perceived um you know by the general public and are you okay with that being you know out and out there um you know i've unfortunately experienced two times in my green party career where candidates stepped back and ultimately either decided not to run for office or actually uh, you know ended their came campaign abruptly because of things that were in both cases were were not really like you know unethical or inappropriate but just maybe would be perceived that way and they just didn't want to deal with potential sort of, you know, you know, discussion in the general, you know, on social media, you know, they just didn't want to have their personal lives like out in front um, for the world to see. And so that's just, you know, something else that we, we need to consider before we run for office. Um, because if you actually are truly contesting for power, you know, the, the duopoly will take note and they will come after you. Um, and, you know, that's just reality, right? Um, you know, there's that Frederick Douglass quote about, you know, power conceding nothing without a struggle. And so if we're actually doing our jobs as Greens, you know, we will be and we always are under attack. Um, and that doesn't, unfortunately, that doesn't just mean the party, but it means us as individuals sometimes. Um, and then the, the other context, the other thing to think about, and this is, you know, not only whether you should run, but also whether, you know, whether your goal is realistic, like is winning a realistic goal or some other goal more important, is just what's the context, you know, like what's going on in your state, in your district, um, you know, how winnable of an election is this, you know, is it, do you need to get 20,000 votes to win and the previous green has only ever gotten like 2,000, um, you know, what are some of the, you know, what are some of the numbers that you need to crunch is there something totally unexpected happening where, you know, I think back to Rich Whitney's campaign for governor um, 2006, I think, um, you know, in that context, he skyrocketed to, you know, to huge visibility because the Democrat, Rod Blagojevich, was getting carted off to jail. And so, you know, is there a scandal, like some other thing that changes, you know, who the incumbents are? Um, you know, some other thing that changes the context and makes this campaign and this race either more winnable for a green or perhaps less, depending. Um, and what's the capacity of your local party? Is there a local party? You know, unfortunately, we've got lots of places all over the country that don't have organized local chapters. And, you know, even ones that do have organized local chapters, sometimes they really struggle to support green candidates in the most effective way possible. And so um, all of those are things that you might want to think about before you decide to step into the race. Okay, so this is the this is the part that's dated. So the arc of the campaign year. So pretend that I'm talking to you, you know, in January or better yet, pretend that you're thinking about doing this for 2021. And so the now through February is really February of 2021. Or if you're running this year, pretend we're back in January of 2020. And so the in the earliest stages of your campaign, you know, these are the things that you want to be thinking about. You're, ex you're basically exploring, like, am I even going to do this? You know, talk to people, make sure, you know, talk to your closest friends and allies, um, you know, people that you would 
expect to be on your campaign committee? Should I do this? What do you think? Will you support me? Um, how much time might you give to my effort? Um, those are the kinds of questions that you want to be asking in the very earliest stages. Um, you want to be building your campaign committee. So the key sort of staff and volunteers that you might need. And when I say staff, I don't necessarily mean paid staff. Though, of course, if you can aspire to that, that would be great. And I'm doing another workshop tomorrow on budgeting, fundraising, and finance. Um, but, you know, who are the, you know, sort of your inner circle, the people that you're going to need to help you, you know, push this campaign forward. And, you know, in many cases, that is one and the same as Green Party local leadership or your state leadership. But it, it doesn't necessarily need to be, and I would argue, nor should it be. Running the party and running a campaign are two different things. They have different you know, goals, there's different levels of um, commitment and senses of urgency, and they should work together and be supportive of one another. You know, there should be maybe a couple of party leaders on that inner circle campaign team. But, you know, a campaign is really, I think, um, you know, helping build the Green Party and move us all forward when it's bringing in new blood, new people, new um, allies and supporters. And so who else can you bring to the table and not re rely totally on the Green Party leadership who is already busy, hopefully just organizing for the party itself. Um, you may need to file paperwork, right? Like creating a campaign committee, getting treasury set up, um, you know, filing with your state or county board of elections. Every jurisdiction is totally different. So do not look to me to give you the exact way to do this. But, um, you know, you will need to file some paperwork with somebody, and that typically happens early, early on in the process. Um, you're going to be building infrastructure. And what, by that I mean, you know, things like, um, how do we keep our files as a group? Um, what kind of email are we using? Um, do we have weekly staff, weekly meeting, campaign meetings, or bi-weekly, or something different? Are we using Zoom? Are we meeting in person in normal times? You know, all these things that may seem like really easy things, you know, and they are, they all still need to be decided, and they need to be implemented. And, you know, in some ways, I think about running for office as it's almost like setting up a small business overnight and not, you know, and, and having to produce in that business like almost immediately right and so if you think about any other work that you might do you know whether it's like oh how is the way that we do this here's our process here's our system you know you're pretty much inventing all of that on the fly and then immediately trying to implement it and so you know thinking about the infrastructure that you're going to need whether it's databases um you know social media handles like all of that you know, like getting that set up, your website, getting that set up early on and not waiting until when you're really in the like throes of the campaign to sort of still be, you know, building the boat as we sail, so to speak. Um, again, another thing to do early on is researching issues, developing policy positions. You know, what is it that you are running on? What is your platform? And, you know, I think a combination of the issues that are most important to you personally the issues that really set apart and distinguish the Green Party from your opponents and issues that resonate with your local community and with the, you know, the voters that you're trying to reach. So something in, you know, those are the sort of three bucket areas that I would look towards. Um, I think you also want to narrow it down to maybe like three or four issues. It's really difficult for voters to digest an entire, you know, like, you know, master's level thesis of 27 point, you know, platform. Um, so, you know, you can take like, look at the 10 key values and break it down into things that make sense for your district, for your local office, for what you're running for. Um, but again, things that you personally can't pay, care about, things that distinguish the Green Party from other, the other parties um, and things that are important to your community. Um, you're going to want to do some one-on-ones with key influencers and constituencies. So these are things like, you know, oh, maybe the local, and I saw someone in the chat mention the League of Women Voters. So like, you know, people who are leaders or members of different organizations that might eventually endorse you. Uh, people who are just 
leaders in the community. They may not have any particular title, but you know that if so-and-so, you know, puts in a good word for you, then 20 other people are going to listen, right? And so in normal times, I would have said, call them up, take them out for a cup of coffee. Uh, you know, now, maybe now it's a Zoom coffee, but you want to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with folks to sort of, you know, again, float this idea. Like, I think I'm going to run for office. What do you think? What would it take for you to support me? Um, and so maybe, you know, the, the campaign committee and your initial exploration might be a tighter circle. And this is sort of the next, the next larger circle. So maybe some other, you know, leaders who are not necessarily going to join in on your campaign and be making phone calls and doing your, you know, your daily work, but who have constituencies of their own, local labor leaders, you know, um, perhaps there might be one or two elected officials, you know, progressive Democrats who might be picked off to endorse you. I mean, that's pretty, you know, it, it, it doesn't usually happen, but you never know. Um, you know, Sierra Club, you know, a lot of these organizations, unfortunately, sort of always go Democratic regardless. Um, and you will know in your community what those organizations and who those leaders are, but definitely do some outreach. Fundraising. Fundraising is a key and important strategy, basically from fr front start to finish. Like every single slide you're going to see from here on out is going to have fundraising on it. Um, raising money early is hugely important because then it allows you to spend, to buy the things that you need early on to get your message out and to build momentum. So early, early money is key. Um, a sneak preview for what I'm going to talk about tomorrow in the fundraising section is this is your, this is your tool. If you're a candidate, your cell phone is your fundraising tool. You get on the phone and you call 100 people in your contacts list and you ask them each for $100. And I'm not joking, like that's how to do it. And that will raise you $10,000. Granted, not everyone's gonna do it. Some will give you 50, some can only give you 20. But I'm talking about your cousin, your barber, you know, the babysitter who used to watch your kids. It doesn't matter how political they are. It doesn't matter if they even agree with you. You know, my Republican father-in-law would easily write me a check, even though we pretty much agree on nothing, because I'm his daughter-in-law and he supports me. And so, you know, ask the people that you know personally to give you money for your run for office. Um, that is how you start. And then once you have that early seed money, you can be putting out flyers and, you know, other things to sort of build your visibility, you know, and then the hope is that the campaign itself has momentum and grows and becomes a thing and people hear about it, you know, like the average person who never knew you before this. And that's where you start getting your, you know, the later money is when the campaign itself is attracting dollars and donations because it's taking off. Whereas the early money is really like your, your friends and your friends and family, your supporters. Um, you want to make sure you know the office that you're running for. Um, you know, like, what does a city council person do? What does the local sheriff do? What does a state representative do? You know, it's, ne it's, it's always a little cringy to hear people talking about, you know, some international policy when they're running for state representative, because at state rep, there's not really much you can do about, like, the United States nuclear agenda, for example. Um, you know, of course, you can make statements about it, and there's, you know, there's small ways, but you know, it's, you should be really clear on what this office actually does, what the purview is, and it will also help you have good stories to tell on the campaign trail. And so what I often recommend is, and again, this is especially if you're going to run next year, you want to run for school board, go to school board meetings or visit their virtual meetings, whatever's happening. You know, like, listen to the types of things that they debate. Think about, well, what would I, if I were elected in that seat, how would I rule on that issue? And then that's a story you can tell later on the campaign trail. See, the reason we need Hillary Kane on the school board is because, you know, if I had been faced with such and such a decision last year on how to safely reopen schools in the, in the light of COVID, I would have said blah, 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 you know, like that type of thing. Um, to really know what the, the issues are that that elected body or that position deals with and to be able to speak articulately about the processes 
what some of maybe your competitors and the incumbents were doing and you know so and so wasn't even attending that vote you know those those types of things um so get to know the office or the body that you'd be representing um of course learn the nomination procedures and i'm not talking about paperwork with the state board of elections or the county board though that's part of it but assuming that you have a local green party what does it take to actually get nominated and endorsed by that local party? Um, and so that's really a sit down with your local party leadership um, if you don't know those folks already. Um, you want to get a professional headshot so that, you know, you're going to use it on your website, on campaign literature. There's lots of places. Um, and so you definitely want to have a photo that looks good and looks like you could, like people could imagine Ah, I can see that person as a mayor. I could see that person as a senator. Um, you know, as much as people say they want things that are non-traditional, um, we have to, in, in some ways, overcompensate and really help people believe that we can govern. And unfortunately, that means looking the part in the most traditional way um, possible when it comes to, you know, headshots and campaign literature. Um, and then the last thing that I would say, as if this wasn't enough already, <laughs> is doing some, you know, voter analysis and data crunching, like what will it actually take to win this office? How many votes are we talking about? Um, can you get more granular? What parts of the city or the district are most likely to produce the, the votes for green versus other parts? Um, you know, there are people who can help you with this kind of thing, but really taking a look at the numbers and trying to think about, okay, like what is, what's the number that I'm trying to reach? What is my goal? You know, if I, if I'm trying to win, what is the number that I need to get there? So, all right, that's the beginning. The next part. So once you get to the spring, um, you might do a formal launch or announcement. Um, you know, and you can be creative with that. I've seen candidates, you know, announce in front of like the local elementary school in their neighborhood, especially if they're going to campaign on, you know, school funding issues. You know, certainly here in Philadelphia, we've had people announce in front of like the Liberty Bell. I remember um, the year that Sherry Honkala ran for state representative in a special election. She announced in front of the, 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 um, the Capitol building in Harrisburg. So, you know, you certainly can get creative with that. Um, I don't know if that means like in, you know, COVID times, you just need to have a Zoom background of the, <laughs> of your state capital. Um, you know, it is still possible, of course, to be out in the world with just a very small group of people. And of course, you know, wearing your mask and stuff, but, um, you know, think creatively about how you might want to launch. Um, you know, it's a, it's an event. It's a thing that can hopefully drive some media attention. You know, it, it's not an excuse to be quiet and silent you know, campaigning for office is a very public thing. And you really have to have the sort of personality and or willingness to basically put yourself in front of the camera, you know, literally or figuratively all the time. And so every time you do something of note, and of note is actually not that, you know, like just opening an office, launching your campaign, filing paperwork, meeting with somebody, you know, like, any of those things are reasons to put out a press release and to sort of call attention to yourself. And so, you know, when you do a launch, do think about the type of, you know, the ways to sort of jazz it up and make it more of a newsworthy event. Um, you're gonna, of course, have your website launched by this time. Um, you're gonna have social media launch. You know, you're gonna be developing press contacts so that when you send those press releases, you have people to send them to. Uh, hopefully, your local or your state party can help with this. And in the very worst case scenario, the national party can help with this. So obviously we have, you know, media contacts at sort of the 10,000 foot level and we're not gonna necessarily have like, you know, those really local community papers that might be important in your neighborhood. But, you know, if you have to develop this from scratch, so be it, but hopefully your state or local party will have, will have started this for you. Um, you might be doing ballot access, depending on, again, the local laws in your state or county. Every state, every jurisdiction is different. There is no common thread here, but in most cases, there is some requirement to get on the ballot, whether it's a primary or in most cases for Greens, just the November general election. You need to know what that process is. 
Here in Pennsylvania, that would take place primarily in the spring and into the early part of the summer. But that could be, you know, I think in Texas, it would have happened in December. So, um, so just know you really got to know what those processes are and make sure that you're doing them at the right time. Um, maybe you can break into primary debates. And so this is something that we often struggle with here in Philadelphia. But I'm again remembering this guy, Hugh Giordano, that we ran in 2010 for state representative. He was the one who wanted to run for city council first. And the thing that we always get is, you know, our primary is like April, May. And then, you know, the November general is in November. And so Philadelphia, like many communities across the country, is essentially a one party town, right? It's like 80% Democrats. You know, and many rural communities are the opposite, right? They're super red. And so here in Philly, it's very common for civic organizations, the Sierra Club, you know, even the League of Women Voters to have all kinds of debates and community meetings and gatherings for the primary and all the Democratic Party candidates come out and sort of debate each other. And then, you know, we say, well, hey, can we get invited? And they're like, well, no, this is about the primary. And then by October, we say, hey, when is your general election debate going to happen? And they're just like, oh, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> because, you know, the primary really is the election in Philadelphia. And so I remember in 2010, this candidate that we had, Hugh, was great because he basically just showed up to all those Democratic Party primary debates anyway. And he didn't necessarily get invited to debate, but he would, you know, somehow weasel his way onto the stage at the very end of the event and just do a little spiel and like, and by the way, I'm also running and you'll see me on the November, ba you know, the November ballot, blah, 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 blah. And he got a lot of attention that way. Um, so just realize that in many communities, those types of events are happening. And even if you're not on the primary, you still might want to try to find a way to show up and have your supporters be there um, and, you know, try to make some hay of it. Um, you're going to be going again in normal times, lots of meets and greets and community meetings, you know, to the best that you can in these virtual times, try to figure out how to do that. You know, if people are, if they're having Zoom meetings, you know, sign up, attend, use the chat box, you know, obviously this is not the greatest for sort of small group networking and meet and greet, but, you know, to the best that you can try to do that and get your volunteers to you know, to be doing that on your behalf because you can't actually be in every single place at the same time, even though now you can like zap into meeting after meeting after meeting without any travel time. Um, again, you're gonna be fundraising. Remember, I said fundraising was on every single slide and I mean it. Um, you know, one of the unfortunate things I think that sometimes we as Greens get into is this magical thinking that running for office doesn't require money. Um, you know, we are definitely about no big money in politics, no corporate money in politics, but that doesn't mean that there's no money at all. And unfortunately, I talked to way too many candidates who are super proud that they only raised $100 or only $500. You know, like I didn't even have to file campaign finance paperwork. I mean, if, if your goal is to simply be on the ballot to just say the Green Party was on the ballot, fine. But if your goal is to actually win or even motivate and generate excitement and buzz about the Green Party and build new volunteers and get more people, you know, sort of on our team or really push an issue and get in the local, if you want people to take you seriously, you got to raise some real money and spend some real money. I'm not talking millions. But like, it shouldn't be too difficult for even a local race to raise in the five to $10,000 range to get some really nice professionally printed literature, to have some paid staff doing the heavy lift, you know, to pay for a nice looking website. You know, there's a lot of expenses when you're really doing this well. Um, and so please do not be afraid of raising money. It is necessary. Um, you know, we're just, we're not talking about $10,000 checks from any one person who has undue influence, but you know, that small dollar fundraising is great, but it does need to add up to something and you need to do it. Um, all right, you actually need to secure the nomination and it, this may take place in a different time frame in the year, depending on your local context, but here in Philadelphia, that would often be the spring. 
Um, and again, more voter targeting, more analysis, thinking about where your votes are going to come from, which communities are you going to focus on. You know, it's very rare that Greens have the bandwidth to really be everywhere across a city, a state, a district. And so depending on your goals, if your goal is to win, that might mean you focus on one part of your neighborhood or your district. If your goal is to build the Green Party, you know, it might be in a completely different part of the community where maybe voter registration is low and you're just sort of, you know, really your, your goal is just getting more people to register and to register as green and they may not actually turn out and vote for you. And that might not be the winning strategy, but might, that might be the party building strategy. So that's why I think it's also, it's really important to think about what is your goal and have that drive the way you do your outreach. All right, a couple more slides and then we're gonna get into um, discussion because I know there's been some good chats and I wanna make sure that we're all hearing that. All right, so the summer, um, you know, right now, key time, door-to-door um, -door outreach, phone banking, social media. Um, I feel like you can still do door-to-door -door even in COVID times. Uh, maybe you're not gonna, let's say, knock on the door and be in people's faces. Maybe you're gonna knock on the door and run back to the sidewalk <laughs> and shout at them um, with, you know, with a mask on, or at the very least, just leave a piece of literature. Like, you can do that, right? Um, you know, phone banking for sure, social media, text banking, all of these things. All right, I'm gonna put someone on mute there. Um, you know, all of these things are ways to do outreach. I think obviously now we have to rely so much more heavily on, you know, computer-based methods of communication and the phone. But however you're doing it, you're reaching out to voters. Um, press releases. Again, any little possible thing is a reason to send out a press release. You know, oh, there's a current event. You know, what's your position on the George Floyd protest that just happened? What's your position on the decision that the mayor just made? What's your position on what the incumbent just said? What's your position on the latest Supreme Court ruling and how it affects your community? Whatever. Um, those are all, re and you know, even if you don't think the media is going to take it and put it in the newspaper the next day, and they probably won't, it, you can put it on your website. And then your website looks like it's dynamic and constantly changing and there's new things because it's an active campaign. Um, you know, that's what you're aiming for. It's, I am one of the people who helps review, the whole CCC helps review um, applications for financial support from campaigns. And, you know, sidebar, we will be doing that in September, August, September after the convention. So. Um, look for emails about how to, if you're running this year, look for emails about how to apply for that money. And so we're reviewing in like August, September, October for November elections. And we will go to campaign candidates' websites and we'll see like it hasn't been updated since May or it has like almost no current information. That is not a good look for an active campaign. And that does not tell us that you have an active campaign going on. So, you know, churn out content, say things about what's going on in the world, put it out to the media, put it out on your website, put it out on social media, just put it out there um, because the world needs to know that you're actually running for office and what you think about things. That is one of the, one of the ways that we, you know, get elected. Um, you might still be doing ballot access in the summer. Hopefully, I mean, again, this was sort of developed in the pre-COVID world house parties, block parties, honk and waves. You probably could still do a honk and wave, you know, socially distant, maybe like six feet apart on a, you know, median strip, I don't know. Um, you know, obviously there's not really gay pride parades and neighborhood festivals this year, um, at least in this part of the country and it feels like all over now. Um, so again, however you need to transform those things or however they are transformed, um, you know, still find a way to invite yourself and you know, do, do the best you can with this, these kind of things virtually. Um, you're gonna be recruiting volunteers. Um, in you know, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna talk about get out the vote and your election day operation. And you will often need volunteers to staff that. And so, you know, thinking about, thinking about that now, right? You don't wanna start recruiting volunteers for something in November you know, on October 30th, you want to start doing that now and laying the groundwork. 
um, you're going to be doing something called voter ID. And again, this is more of the trying to do the analysis of who you think your voters will be, what parts of your district. Um, in normal times, I would really, you know, block by block, like I would be putting up maps of my district and making sure we door knocked every street, you know, three times. I mean, ideally, if you have the volunteers to do it, that you're phone banking, that you know, you're know you going and you're doing something called, um, actually, I don't know what it's called, it's the voter ID process, but when you knock on doors and talk to people, or in, or in COVID times, call them on the phone and hopefully talk to people, you're, you're doing a quick assessment of like, does this person support my candidate or did they just you know, spit in my face slash hang up on me? Right? And so you're gonna, you're gonna sort of give them a one to five ranking. And it could be that five is the most supportive and one is the least or the other way around. It doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent. And essentially it's assuming five is a guaranteed vote for the green and one is a guaranteed vote for somebody else. You wanna be identifying your threes, fours and fives, right? The fours and fives are the people who are either definitely gonna vote for you or probably gonna vote for you. And the threes are sort of undecided. And later on in the campaign year, you're going back to call the fours and fives to remind them to vote. And you're calling the threes to try to keep convincing them to vote for you. And you're pretty much ignoring the ones and twos. That's how it works. Um, so again, having like a database for this, having a field operation where people are knocking on doors or in COVID times calling people, identifying who the voters are that will support you and then continuing to message them and, and then at some point actually remind them to vote. And again, you're fundraising, because remember that's on every single slide. <laughs> um, all right, September is really, and let me just like put a pin in this and things have changed even here in Philadelphia, but you know, I know many of you are now in places where there's early voting. And so that changes things completely. And to be honest, I haven't yet experienced an election with early voting. We just, we don't really have early voting in Pennsylvania now, but we have a shortened window for um, registration. And now because of mail-in ballots, we have an earlier voting window than we ever used to. So here it used to be election day was basically it. And unless you were like, you know, stationed abroad or, you know, like on your deathbed, you couldn't get a mail-in ballot, an absentee ballot. And now, of course, that's kind of, you know, the norm. But I will say that this is coming from sort of the more old school machine style politics that we have in the Northeast with, you know, election day being the thing. You will obviously have to make adjustments in your timeline and strategy if you have a situation where you have a lot of robust early voting. And I remember talking to Aaron Fox, who's on the campaign, the coordinated campaign committee in Michigan, and he was telling me that in Michigan, they had local elections where like 45% or more of people were voting early, which could be three, four, five weeks in advance. And so just keep that in mind as I go through this, these last couple of slides, because, you know, again, I'm coming from the sort of more traditional old school Northeast machine style politics, and it could be really different in your community. Um, so with that in mind, September, ongoing outreach, again driven by that voter targeting you know who are the can who are the households that you need to knock on or that you haven't reached yet or remind them um still the, again the threes you're trying to convince the fours and fives you're going to remind to vote because you can never take anyone's vote for granted you're doing more press releases in normal times more visibility house parties honking waves farmers markets etc um so again, however you can do that virtually, more volunteer recruitment, more, you know, it's essentially more of everything. It just really ramps up in the fall. Um, and if you haven't yet, you're going to be developing your promotional material, your election day literature, you know, whatever you're going to be putting on people's doorsteps to remind them that you exist, that you're running for office, that election day is Tuesday, November, whatever, and you're, you know, it, like, and here's how to vote, here's where to vote, et cetera. Um, and then you maybe, if things are really going amazing for you and you've got some resources, maybe you're going to launch a campaign office. Um, I've worked on, I guess, one campaign that really had a legit office um, when Sherry Honkala ran for sheriff in 2011. And it was great. We had the ability to, you know, all meet in the same place. 
and really, you know, get volunteers just cranking out. I mean, obviously, maybe this just seems like wishful thinking in COVID times, and by even by this September, that's not going to happen. So, you know, but hopefully, if you're thinking about September 21, hopefully things will be, you know, back to somewhat normal by then, and we could actually be together in an office doing work collaboratively. Imagine that. Um, all right, and then the arc of a campaign year, the last bit, October, final outreach, more press releases, de possible debates, get out the vote planning. You know, again, if things are really going amazing, maybe you can actually afford and do ads on the radio, cable TV, Facebook, you know, all that, well, some of that stuff is not too expensive and it is very possible. Um, and then of course, the last bit, you know, the actual implementation of your get out the vote plan, you know, some try to do some really high visibility events for earned media. Um, and when we say earned media, that means, you know, you're not paying for the ad. You've actually earned it because you're doing something that is fundamentally newsworthy. Um, and then think about, you know, regardless of the outcome, you know, and I, I mean, I will say I have never been on a winning Green Party campaign, unfortunately. Um, but we always have an election night celebration because you want to thank your volunteers. You want to celebrate the hard work that you've done. Um, again, I don't know if we'll be able to do in-person gatherings, um, but you want to do something that recognizes people's efforts and work. Um, you know, usually in the Green Party, like it's a pizza party. It's nothing amazing, but, um, you know, we're not talking swanky, you know, you know, balls and all that kind of jazz. But, you know, something where people can come at the end of the night if they've been at the polls all day volunteering and just, you know, debrief and decompress and you know sort of give everyone a pat on the back and say job well done and so again if you can't do that in person um, try to find a virtual way to do that type of thing and make sure you thank everyone thank all your donors thank all your volunteers you know it's really important it makes people feel good it's the kind of thing that will get people coming back to the table giving money again giving their time again um, it really does deserve a thank you all right, I think I'm basically done. Um, you know, this is just a recap of all the different areas of work that, and I'm sure there's more that I didn't even think of, but and in, a, and in a perfect world, you'd have someone in charge of all these things, right? Like you'd have an inner circle committee of like a dozen people or however many bullets there are in this list. And there would be somebody who was in charge of each of these things. Again, it doesn't have to be paid staff. And when I say paid staff, we're almost never talking about like, 40 hour a week, full-time salary with benefits, right? We're talking like a stipend, right? And it could be $200 a week. It could be $500 a week if you're really doing great. Um, but, you know, something or just really amazing volunteers who are stepping up, into plate, up to the plate and saying, I'm going to handle your media. I'm going to handle your fundraising. I'm going to take care of the ballot access. So, you know, it's impossible for one person to do all of this. And I've seen too many candidates burn out because they are essentially a committee of one. That is not a recipe for success. Um, you need to recruit volunteers to help you do all these things. And if you're really, I mean, this is gonna be some tough talk, but if you're really struggling and you can't find a single person that you know that's willing to volunteer to help you do some of this, maybe you shouldn't be running for office. And I say that because if you can't inspire your five friends to help you, like how are you inspiring the general public to vote for you? And so give that some thought. If you're not the person who should be in front of the camera, that's okay. There's still plenty of ways to move this work forward. You know, find someone who does generate that enthusiasm from other people and volunteer to work on their campaign. All right, and then your next steps. Like if you're thinking, if you're sitting there listening to my rambling spiel here and you're like hmm maybe i will run for office you know and we're talking again about 2021 or beyond you know these are the things to start thinking about you know what are your personal goals for running what are the issues in your community what is the greet your local green party's goals you know talk to your family talk to your job talk with your political allies and i say maybe your foes too and then of course talk to the coordinated campaign committee so that we can help you think about the way to do this and I think that's it. I think that's my final slide. So I'm gonna um, shut up for a minute and I would love to open the floor for Q&A um, or other just commentary, that's fine. And if people can use the raise hand tool, 
which is in, I know if you click on participants and sort of hover over your own name and more, um, I think maybe, I don't know, I'm as the moderator, I can't actually quite see how this works, but there is a way for you to sort of raise your hand. You can also type chat, I'm sorry, stack in the chat box. Um, those would be sort of the easiest because we're now at 45 participants. And if we all just take ourselves off mute and sort of try to talk, it will be a little messy. So, um, so that's it. So let's move into some Q&A here. And um, I'm going to stop the slide share. And that's all, folks. Let's have some discussion. We have, I think, about 20 minutes left. All right, Nassim from California is the first one on the stack. Nassim, why don't you introduce yourself as well and feel free to ask your question. Thank you, Hillary. I have heard this presentation by you a couple of times. It never gets old. It's oh, I always hear something new in it. So thank you so much. My name is Nassim Uri. I'm a delegate from California and a delegate to the PNC. I really appreciate hearing this. Two points that you have repeated and I wish we all heard even more clearly and kept in mind is number one, uh, you really have to run a serious campaign. You know, I appreciate every single Green that decides to run because I know everyone realizes what an uphill battle it is and how difficult it is. But um, I do want to remind everyone that you do have to uh, come across as serious. You have to put in the work. And I'm not sure that it does our party a lot of good if we have um, folks that really want to help and do spend their time and effort um, you know, starting a campaign, but don't follow through and really get discouraged very quickly. So the best thing I have learned to uh, figure out how to learn about running for campaign is helping other people. So thank you for mentioning that. And uh, one note is uh, one of the awesome campaigns that I'm helping with is Jake Tonko, who's running for San Jose City Council uh, in District 6. And uh, the a very... Um, difficult choice that we had was how soon do we go door knocking in the primary we knocked on 29,000 doors uh, 13,000 of them he himself knocked on so um, and that's how he got uh, a real good number of votes and moved on to a runoff what we've done was I thought was very clever he came up with a little note to add to his walk card, which is also another amazing tool that every campaigner should have, which is your leave behind essentially. And it almost looks like a post-it note. And it said that this is, it says, um, this is handled with gloves and a mask for your safety. We wish we could knock on your door, but this is uh, the best we can do. So please contact us uh, at this, at this uh, you know, contact information. So it's a really easy lit drop. Um, so we're going to start doing that this week. And I think that's a good replacement for canvassing right now. But uh, we're hoping to start canvassing soon too. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. I love the the little new sort of COVID disclaimer on, you know, your literature. I think that that's brilliant. So wonderful. All right, I see some raised hands. Margaret Elizabeth is next on the stack. Thank you very much. For, it's a really nice class. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. My question is just, or can we get a, a hard copy of the slides and everything that you use today? Yes, you can. Um, right now it's a Google slide in our, um, party Google Drive and I'm happy to share it with whomever um, and or just download it. I can even just download it and put it in the chat box, I think. So give me a moment and I will do that. Thanks. Uh, no problem. And our, while I'm doing that, I think the next person who had hand raised is Bradley from Oregon. Yeah, uh, um, thank you for the presentation. My question is, do you think it's really necessary to get Paul and local office elections first. Obviously, everybody would like to uh, first. I'm really kind of interested in the campaign manager. But do you think you, you absolutely need the experience at the at levels, uh, you know, at, at levels like at the school board level and so forth, to even have a chance of making an impact at a national level office? So I could barely hear you. I don't know if other people could hear I'm you more so clearly. Is this any better? Yes. Speak really oh, into your mic. <laughs> now. Um, I apologize. So uh, my question is, is, do you think that it's 
better, it's, it's always better to try to do something at a local level office uh, initially to gain the experience before trying to do something for a national level office. Is that really mandatory or is it possible just to go for trying to help somebody run for Congress without having tried school boards and other types of things first? Um, I mean, look, there's nothing in this world that's an always or a never, right? Um, never say never, right? Um, but I, I still, I would say like generally, yes, it's better to cut your teeth on a more local office. But again, depending on the context, depending on the circumstances, the issues you care about. I mean, I think it's perfectly fine for Greens to run for Senate and Congress and governor and president and things that we basically, I mean, unfortunately right now have no real shot of winning because we need to be putting ourselves out there and showing voters what distinguishes us and what we care about. And in my experience, those distinctions are more apparent at those higher levels. Um, that said, you know, they're pretty much impossible races for us to win at the moment with few exceptions, right? And so I think, you know, it's, it's, there's no one way to do it. I mean, obviously it also just depends on who your candidate is. And again, the year, the circumstances, like, you know, Rich Whitney did an amazing job putting us on the map in Illinois in 2006 when he was running against Blagojevich. Um, I mean, he got like 10% of the vote, which, you know, in some ways sounds like nothing, but for a Green Party running in a head-to-head -head race for statewide office, that's amazing, you know, in a, in a state the size of Illinois. Um, so, you know, it's never, I, again, never say never, but in general, I would say I would prefer that more Greens, you know, that like we, we aimed for a little more low-hanging fruit and we got, you know, elected in mass at lower levels because in from like just like in the rest of life you know a lot of it is getting your feet wet you know earning your chops doing your time you know learning the ropes and you know sort of going from like small office to the next bigger office to the next bigger office and i think you know voters will respect that you know um and you actually learn more about how to you know run for that bigger office because you have some credibility because you have a track record um, you know, we have a guy, we had somebody in my local party who's, you know, kind of new to the party and quite frankly, clearly very new to politics, activism, anything. And, you know, he just came out one day and was like, we, I want to run for city council. And we all kind of went, Ooh, you know, because he has no following. He has no base. He has no supporters. He has no networks. He has done nothing to show anyone why he should be in city council. And granted, yes, he's a green and he subscribes to our platform and he's a nice guy, but he hasn't yet demonstrated any leadership. And, you know, city council in Philadelphia is a big deal. And so, you know, I think, well, I think we need to look for people who are actually leaders and that doesn't mean they have a title. It doesn't mean that they have, um, you know, money or power. It just means that like when, when they talk, people listen. And those, those natural leaders are in all communities and all walks of life. Um, and it's, sometimes it's just not us. Like, you know, maybe we're, we're the behind this, the wind beneath the wings and that's okay. I myself have never run for office. Um, I, but I've worked on a bunch of campaigns. Like I know I'm not the person who's gonna be the one doing, you know, in front of the camera. Um, but I think, you know, I think we sometimes you know, we're nice people and we believe everyone should have the right to run and everyone should have the right to run. But this doesn't mean everybody's gonna be good at it. And so it's, I know we often struggle with, you know, I have, we have nominated a lot of candidates in my time who really shouldn't have been nominated because they just weren't great candidates. Um, they were good people. They had all the right ideas and opinions, but they, you know, it's just, it's a different, you know, doing this candidate thing is really a special skill set that can be learned, right? It's not just like you either have it or you don't, but you got to learn it. And so I would prefer that people sort of do that learning in a smaller setting, a smaller office than like running for cent. Okay, um, hopefully that answered your question. Um, George is, has his hand raised. So George Gluck, you are next. That's and then I see there's lots of chats that I haven't paid attention to. So I'm going to look at those next. Yeah, I'd like to answer that last question in some way. Uh, I wasn't going to run for office at all until we had a special election for our county council. 
and I figured I'd give it a shot because it was a six-week uh, campaign. Uh, terrible campaigner then. I'm not sure I'm that much better now, although I hope I am. Uh, but uh, the second time I ran was less than a year later for uh, an at-large seat. And it turned out that there were as many voters for that at-large seat in Montgomery County as there are for Congress. And uh, our local Green Party asked me to continue to run for county council. But as you guys can see, I'm probably amongst the oldest on, uh, in the gallery here. And you can tell by my share. This is the 20th anniversary of my voting for Nader in Denver um, 20 years ago. So uh, I chose to run for Congress for another reason, despite what you said. And that is uh, you get to run every two years as opposed to every four. And the advantage of that, of course, is uh, one of the things I do, is, as I said to Clay privately, is I, I sub in math and science in high schools in the congressional district, and I go and knock on doors. And by now, I've had 10,000 or more students who've ha had me. And my hope is that uh, when they hear I'm running again, they will now vote. I, I couldn't tell them I was running in class. that would have gotten me thrown out of school. But um, so at any rate, uh, my opponents have always been very rich. They've had all the money they wanted. Uh, the present rep here is, is David Trone. He, you guys probably have heard of him. Uh, he, he spent the most money ever getting to Congress, over $30 million. Uh, so money is, there's no way I'm gonna compete in, with money, but the only other resource I've had is time. And uh, I, I just mentioned one other thing and then I'll shut up. Uh, I did find doing some unusual things can, can help you. Uh, years ago, the, the local paper is now defunct, but we had the paper that put out editions in every area around here. And they had promised to write a piece because I, I wanted to run the district from the Pennsylvania line to the DC line. And they were gonna do that in all their editions. And it turned out they reneged, but they did it in a very conservative area. And I found out that I got more, a larger percentage of votes in that area because of the article they wrote. It wasn't even an article, it was just a, a picture with a, a large, caption underneath indicating who I was and what I was doing and why I was doing it. So doing something unusual like that can get you many more votes. And I think you mentioned that. So I'll shut up now. Thank you. That was, that's an important point that I never thought about. So um, yeah, so again, yeah, there's no one easy answer for any of this. Um, you just kind of have to go with your gut and what seems right at the time. So I have nobody else with hands raised and the chat just looked like a bunch of great ideas back and forth. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has another question or comment that they want to, you know, say for the whole good of the group. Um, I, I will stop. Chris, thank you. Chris Richardson, go right ahead. Okay, well, uh, again, you know, we have a duopoly going which has uh, um, got the people brainwashed in that there are only two choices. And we need to encourage them to realize that the duopoly is not on their side and that all the things that they're offering, they withdraw at the last minute. And we also need to recognize that where have all the, the progressive ideas gone? They've gone back to the Green Party, where they, they came from. And the, the, uh, the DNC pulls them out for pulling people in, and then at the last minute, they withdraw them. This, this is, uh, you know, Charlie Brown and Lucy all over again, and we fall for it every time. And we need to stop playing their game. They are running a game on us and they have succeeded. And they've, they've relegated us back to uh, a, a situation where they run the game and we need to change the game. We need to change the game to ranked choice voting. And we also need to make the process more visible so that the, the voters come back. We have 40, 60% of the voting population that does not vote in the general election. There is nothing for them to vote for because of the primary. 
We Right now, we've got two candidates for president, and both of them are terrible. And, you know, the, the, they've proven that the primary, uh, the exit polls do not match at all what the, the DNC was reporting. And so, you know, we end up with a candidate that was not elected and not, not selected by the population of voters. And yet we, that's who we end up with. And it's all because people are believing what they're being told and not what is real. And that's the problem here. We need to express, express that, yes, we need to recognize that they pulled the, the rug out from under us with, you know, when they started this, this whole campaign for the primary, they had all these progressive ideas out there and they were wonderful and people were saying, yes, that's what we want. And now where are they? They're gone. If Biden has, the only platform he has is I'm not Trump. That's it. And he has no plan, nothing. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's the sentiment that we need to tap into. Um, so thank you for that, Chris. Um, it looks like the other Chris has his hand up. Chris LaDuke. Yeah, it's Chris LaDuke now. Chris LaDuke. Chris Richardson, you are so correct that the Democrats during the general were all talking Green New Deal. And where is that? It's it, that part of the political discourse has vanished. Um, Greta's energy, the Fridays for Future energy has vanished. We are the green party. They are our allies. We are against violence. Black lives is our, our allies. We need to be harnessing our allies. The tens and hundreds of millions of people who agree with our platform. And we need to be rallying that energy to fight to get Dario or Howie or whoever comes out of this weekend as our candidates into those debates. I know, Jill, um, First time I met Jill was right after her defeat. And the story of Jill is amazing. The, the, what she fought for, her professional background as a doctor, I literally breathe fresh air these days where there used to be a smokestack. Um, we, couldn't, we couldn't get her story out. Times have changed. Everybody's on lockdown. It is the internet how everything spreads. And just the hundreds of people who are here this weekend if we start telling dozens of people, please just spread the word, we can get in the debates. And that's all we need. I understand we probably can't win. I hope we can send somebody to D.C. That would, that's what we need, is at least one legislator in the Capitol. Two, could we do that? But if we can get someone on the stage with those two, uh, no disrespect to their age or their intellect or the senility, but either one of our candidates would make, whoever our candidate is, would make them look silly and foolish. And it would force the future to start thinking about like renewable energy resources and pollution and militarism. And the words equal pay for equal work. I was born in 1973, the fight was happening then. It's, it's not even on the agenda of anybody. Um, yeah. I could rant for, I could rant yeah, for hours. You. The thing is though, I'm sorry, the, I could rant for hours. Our problem, I feel like as a party in general, is it's easy to preach to the choir. We all agree, it's madness. These fools that are making the decisions for us, it's a duopoly and the game is rigged. Yes, we all agree. We need to be convincing red states. We can't write off Trump supporters, they agree with us. We need to be convincing Democrats. We need to be pulling in independence. The Sunrise Movement made 400,000 phone calls. And I know they're a Democratic pack and it's sketchy. I don't know their exact motives, but that energy is not married to the Sunrise Movement. Right, I think your um, last point there about the independence, I mean, you know, this is sort of a perennial debate in the Green Party of like, who do we need to bring in? And is it, you know, are we picking off the Bernie, you know, disaffected Bernie Kratz? And the answer, of course, is yes, but also, I mean, really, I think the big room for growth for us is all of who aren't even 
registered, um, you know, in the first place, young people, people just turning 18, you know, communities of color that have been disenfranchised for years and have just decided to sit out because like, why bother? Um, so I think, you know, Chris, you're right. We've got, there's a lot of places that we need to, to really start ramping up. Um, let's give some time because I think we're basically at time. So I know Molly, you're the only person I think who hasn't spoke, well, I guess there's a couple people, but since we're literally at time, I'm going to give Molly the last word. Um, so thank you all for joining. What, Molly, why don't you uh, ask your question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I really appreciate this. Um, the um, fact of the matter is, is um, when it comes down to, to it, I actually uh, have spent most of my life in rural communities. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually a um, policy advisor as well. Um, when it comes down to messaging and stuff like that, a lot of uh, the areas I, I specialize in is appealing messaging to uh, rural, com rural communities. This is one of the things I've been trying to focus, especially in Utah, because Utah almost put Hillary Clinton as a third place person and voted for a third party individual, uh, Evan McMullen, uh, largely from is that they, uh, if we focus our messaging, and that's kind of what I'll be revolving my question around, uh, we revolve our messaging around uh, just pro-labor, pro-personal freedoms, which is why uh, if people you know, you have uh, Howie Hawkins, who's a libertarian socialist, and you have, uh, but instead of calling yourself like a libertarian socialist or that kind of thing, uh, what type of approaches do you believe are good for candidates when it comes to messaging the same, basically standing your principles, but just framing it a different way that people uh, uh, relate to? Oh, um, just for context, I'm actually a, uh, a democratic uh, uh, precinct chair who moved over to the Green Party because uh, Joe Biden is a uh, Dixiecrat who actually uh, is the architect of everything that is actually wrong with this country. So, and to the effect that I actually want to create an ad that actually helps promote the fact that it's immoral to, to support Joe Biden, but also because his um, proposal to come back from COVID, uh, and I'll end here, um, was literally the same as Trump. It would result in millions of people dying because they exposed her to, to COVID and would thus lead to a national genocide from my perspective. But I'll leave it there. Uh, as far as messaging, what do you think people should go? So, I mean, I think it really depends. Thank you for that question, Molly. I think it really depends, again, on your community. And so, like, you know, you're talking about being in a rural context, that's obviously going to be different than where I am in Philadelphia, which is a very urban context. But I would say, you know, appealing in some ways to sort of everyone's, you know, basic values, right? I mean, when we talk about, you know, rural campaigning in Pennsylvania, it might be thinking about, you know, local small businesses, local farms, um, you know, appealing to environmental concerns from a different angle. So it might be like, you know, people who actually spend time in nature and wanting to keep that preserved and pristine. We have issues around um, fracking and natural gas extraction in rural communities. We have issues around, you know, rural communities being depopulated and, you know, aging with all the young people fleeing to the city because that's where jobs are. Um, there's tons of issues to talk about. Um, and it actually, this is like the perfect segue because up next in 10 minutes at 2.30 will be the next workshop that is going to be done by AJ Reed and they are going to be talking about campaigning in rural communities. So um, I know AJ wanted pre-registration, I think mostly to just know who was in the room, but um, if you just stick around or log back into the same link in 10 minutes, um, that workshop will be happening. So at this point, we are five minutes over. Um, obviously, we could just go on and on and on and talk about these issues all day. Um, but we are, I'm going to have to, you know, call it. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, and I'm probably going to just take a break myself and...